This podcast contains discussions of child abuse, sexual repression and sexual abuse, suicide, racism, misogyny, PTSD and PTSD symptoms, and spiritual oppression and abuse, including guilt, shame, and fear. In most episodes, we will be mentioning some of these concepts in a general way without any graphic detail. If any of these topics or other triggering topics will be mentioned in great detail, we will let you know at the beginning of each individual episode, as well as in the show notes for that episode. This episode was recorded before the potential Supreme Court overturn of Roe versus Wade was leaked. And I don't want to go into this episode without addressing that really quickly. I know a lot of us are just having a lot of feelings like anger and guilt and fear and so many other emotions. Unfortunately, I don't have answers for you. And I don't want to give you false comfort or false information. But I wanted to say a couple of things just from my heart to a couple of groups of people. First, if you have had an abortion, regardless of your reason why you are loved and supported here unconditionally, you are the judge of your own reasons and needs. And our podcast and the podcast community are and always will be a safe space for you. Second, if you're somebody who grew up in the pro-life world, we are all really going through it right now. For me, I feel like I grew up believing that I was on the losing team. We wanted this outcome, but we didn't believe it would ever happen. Then I spent just a few short years after deconstruction or during deconstruction on the winning team, uh, not wanting Roe to be overturned and thinking that it would never happen. And now I'm on the opposite side of where I started, but I feel like I'm on the losing team again. And that's such an indescribable disappointment. That's a complicated and heavy thing to go through. A lot of people may also have guilt about anti-abortion activism in the past or feel like they're partially responsible for this. Again, I can't tell you it's all going to be okay. I don't have any magic words and I wish I did. But I want you to know at the bare minimum that I see you and I'm going through it too. And we're in this together. The third group of people that I want to speak to really quickly before we start our episode is any listeners who are more conservative on this issue than I am personally. Maybe you are, would describe yourself as pro life, or maybe you don't support abortion bans, but you think they should be regulated more strictly by the government. I don't agree that a fetus at a very young gestational age is a person, like a legal person. But I understand that there are a lot of reasons that you might believe that. And I did at one point in my life very sincerely believe that. I just want to remind those listeners, go back and listen to our episode where we covered this topic in detail. We talked about how legislating abortion does nothing but cause more pain and death. If lowering the abortion rate is truly your goal, there are so many things that can be done to achieve that that don't put half the population at so much risk. So I, did, I would just encourage you to go back and listen to that episode. If you haven't, I think we were able to give it a, a really fair discussion. Love you all. Take care of yourselves. Let's get into the Mother's Day special episode that we recorded previously. Welcome back to the Leaving Eden podcast. Uh, we are your hosts. My name is Gabrielle Hakoen, and I am here with my BFF, Sadie Carpenter. Ooh, Sadie, how are you doing today? I am doing great. We are here to talk about just a, a little bit of a lighter, more fun episode because it is Mother's Day week. And we are going to do our, our yearly Mother's Day special episode. It is your second Mother's Day as a mother. Have uh, Do you have any new insights for us going into this special, very special weekend? I think all that I would say off the top of my head is that last time we recorded a Mother's Day episode, I think I had a like a six week old child <laughs> and now I have a 14 month old child. 
I think all that I would say is that it has been a lot harder than I thought it would be. And it's been so much more fun than I thought it would be. I love Chuck. I just got to see her yesterday. Uh, we went to the we we just hung out and we went to the grocery store. Uh, me and Sadie did, and she is a very sweet baby. She has your face, but she has Jonathan's facial expressions. She's very cute. Yes, she's got his um his eyebrows. <laughs> She always lo- she always looks so incredulous. Like it's a very specific look. She like she always looks like she's saying, "Really?" <laughs> well, so <laughs> like does, so does Jonathan. It. So <laughs> <laughs> she's over everything. She's one year old and she's over everything. She's cooler than you. <laughs> <laughs> to anybody who's listening, Sadie's daughter is cooler than you. So I put her in this little outfit yesterday. I had like a like a long sleeve t-shirt under a little black circle skirt dress and then patterned leggings. And Jonathan said that she looked like she was a record store clerk in 1996. I saw that. It was <laughs> I saw cute. It, it was so cute. Oh. She's she's a wonderful toddler. She's really rambunctious and very, very high energy toddler. Uh, but she is so funny. She is the funniest little baby I've ever known. Yeah, get her a little soccer ball or something. She's you know? got she'll, a basketball she'll be kicking hoop. that thing around. Have I not shown oh, you? Oh, yeah. My my brother sent her a basketball hoop for her first birthday, and we've got it like a little tykes basketball hoop, and we've got it on the lowest setting, and she can just barely stand on her tiptoes and put the ball all the way up over her head and tip it into the basket. So she made her first dunk at like 13 months. Woo. I'm so proud. Yeah, sign her up for the All Star Weekend Dunk Contest. Uh, yeah, we're thinking, you know, basketball scholarship. <laughs> that would be that yeah would be great. Well, you know what you do is, you know, NBA playoffs are going on right now, so you got to do that. I'm sorry, that's not what we're talking about today. Uh, it's Jason. Sadly, what- she girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. Yeah. <laughs> strengthen the arms man that's important for basketball get those three pointers going Mm -hmm. no but today what are we talking about we are talking about proverbs 31 the proverbs 31 woman uh that is so often referenced yeah so today we're going to we're going to dig into ways that the idealized proverbs 31 woman has been used to hurt and control women specifically in the IFB. But we're also going to talk about some feminist interpretations of that verse and try to deconstruct. This is a um, this is a deconstruction live episode, if you will. We're going to kind of <laughs> dig into that, look at some some more feminist reads and some more modern reads of that same chapter. I do want to give the caveat, we're going to use binary terms for the most part in this episode. Because the person in Proverbs 31 is identified as a woman, a lot of these things can, of course, apply to feminine people and birthing parents and, honestly, primary parents of all genders, uh, regardless of whether they were the birthing parent or not. So we are we are going to use the binary terms because this person is specifically identified as a woman, but... Just wanted to give that caveat before we get started. Yeah, and before we get into all of that, I just need to say that the Leaving Eden podcast is a fully independent podcast. We are the podcast about my BFF and co-host Sadie Carpenter's life in and escape from the independent fundamental Baptist cult, aka the cult in which she was raised. We talk about this cult. We talk about other cults. We talk about the real and present threat that cults and cult ideologies pose towards society as a whole. And it is our goal to promote freedom of mind, freedom of thought, and freedom of religion. So if you like our show, if you are an fan of our show, then you can do a couple of things. You can join our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash leaving Eden podcast, where you will get access to extended and uncensored versions of most of our episodes. You can join our Facebook group, which is facebook.com slash groups slash Eden Exodus. And you can join our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash Eden Exodus. We are once again doing Pride Month stories this year. So if you are an LGBTQ person and you would like us to read a story about your experience as an lgbtq person growing up in fundamentalism or a similarly repressive system then please 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 email 
us your story at leavingeatonpod at gmail.com. Make sure that you include, if you want to be referred to by a pseudonym uh, to protect your identity, we will absolutely uh, oblige and make sure that you include your pronouns so that we can refer to you respectfully. I just uh, want to say that um, we've planned our Pride Month and we have some content coming through uh coming for pride month that i'm very excited for i know sadie's very excited for it too um we can't wait to tell you what it's going to be but that's not it's not time for that yet yes i'm i'm really excited about making pride month another one of our yearly traditions brings me great personal joy i think that's all we have as far as housekeeping except for thanking our faith promise missions to your patrons that is true so our faith promise missions to your patrons are the people that really keep the lights on for the show. I don't think that uh, a lot of people really appreciate how much of a shoestring operation this <laughs> podcast is. <laughs> I mean, it, it's true. Um, but our Faith Promise Missions tier patrons, you guys are the people that that pay our bills, uh, that, that make it possible for us to do this show. And your names are Andrew Rocant, Brittany, Carrie R., Crystal Patterson, Eleanor Donahue, Emery Fairlosser. Emery Fairlosser has been an FPM tier patron for a while. Hope Norum as Hope Norum as well. A lot of a lot of long timers in here. We really appreciate you. Jen Kacharski, Jessica Tambo, Tambo like Rambo. A lot, man. Another OG. Yeah, I was gonna say Jessica's an OG. Jessica is an OG. OG. Jessica uh, was Faith. Pro- Jessica and Emery and a couple of those. A couple of these people were uh, Faith Promise Missions tier patrons before it was cool. I mean, it was always cool, but before everyone got into it. Um, after Jessica, we have Kater Wee, Catherine Schneider, Kathleen Moncrief, another OG, Kristen Marie, Linda Morgan, Lorena Watson, Madeline Cusick. Oh, I think Madeline Cusick. That's a new one. Mary Martin, aka the uh, Peter Pan from Broadway. Megan Arndt, another new one. I, I think... Uh, new for this month, Rachel Bernadowitz, Rebecca Hoyt. Oh, Rob, the Methodist, uh, 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 an actual Methodist minister we have in our faith promise missions tier. If we have a Methodist minister in our, uh, does that make us uh, tax deduct, um, tax exempt? I sadly, I don't think so. <laughs> half, half an accounting degree says no. We have an actual minister who uh, is is uh, said. Wow, we really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, uh, do you call a Methodist minister's brother, or is Reverend. that just a Baptist thing? Reverend. Okay, uh, Reverend Stutes. Uh, we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Uh, Sadie's actual BFF Morgan, Sarah Reese, Shane Horton, and as always, the rootness tootness <laughs> Wes the Cowboy. <laughs> Wes has All the right. patient the patience of a saint. <laughs> I'm just yeah. I'm just assuming. <laughs> if if he didn't like me calling him a cowboy, then he wouldn't uh <laughs> stay or he'd tell me about it. Uh anyway, we gotta we gotta we should talk about the Mishla. Uh, what's that? That's the Hebrew name for the book of Proverbs. Oh, okay. Um yeah, so uh, this this book was written by uh, King Shlomo, uh, son of uh, David. Uh, Shlomo is regarded by Christians and Jews and Muslims to be among the wisest of all men and a prophet. So uh, a Shlomo, aka Solomon. I bet you guys didn't know that Shlomo is is Solomon in Hebrew. That has been like the biggest surprise of getting to know you is finding out that the English or the Anglicizations, I don't know, of these Hebrew names correspond, like what they correspond to as far as Hebrew names. Yeah. Because you have a different well, one got- for Lazarus too, I think. I don't know if it's a lot. I, I don't know. Maybe Isn't that laser? I, I can't remember. Isn't that Lazarus? Well, laser, laser is a Yiddish, like my, my great grandfather's name was laser. Which I think is extremely cool on like multiple reasons for like multiple reasons. It's such a fucking cool name. I'm telling you, man. Um, you have to go on that Jewish dating show so you can find a Jewish wife and name your kid that. 
That's true. Uh, <laughs> no, um, but I, it, anyway, uh, it, Solomon, aka Shalomo, uh, is uh, he was he, he is the writer of the book. The, the book of Proverbs is attributed to him. Uh, so Proverbs thirty one that is attributed to to King Solomon, and I just think that you know he would know a good woman from a bad one considering the fact that he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Yeah, man had a lot of uh, experience. But when we when we look <laughs> at Proverbs 31, um it's actually it's his mother giving him pointers on on what to look for in a woman. Really? Yes. But it, okay, so as far as as far as Proverbs, I do have an important question. In Jewish tradition, is Proverbs a book of commandments or a book of wise sayings? Like, how is that looked at? Because hmm. it, okay, for example, if Proverbs says, "Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long," is that a commandment or is that a wise suggestion? Like, is envying is envying sinners a sin, or is it just a smart thing to not do? I am not a rabbi, so I don't know the answer to that question. And I am not a, a Jewish scholar, so I don't know the answer to that question. But this feels like it's really getting into the reads a little bit. It's, it's not, <laughs> though, from the IFB perspective, because if you're into biblical literalism, if the Bible says, do this thing and not that thing, even in a poetic book, a book of wise sayings, then it's a commandment. So before... Proverbs 31 gets into the description of the virtuous woman starting in verse 10, I think. There's an invocation against drinking, which is one of the big passages that the IFB leans on to prohibit alcohol. So I think that what this comes down to is that the IFB has a completely different idea of sin than Jews in general, right? Because I think there's a lot of stuff in the Tanakh that amounts to do not drink five shots of well tequila on an empty stomach, which amounts to if you do this thing, you will absolutely regret it, and it's a bad idea. I shouldn't need to tell you, but like here it is in a book. And then Christians will take it and say, well, what's the meaning behind the number five? Because is it because number five represents death? Is it because alcohol is evil? Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and Christians will also say, oh, so I can drink four shots of well tequila on an empty stomach, and that's completely fine. <laughs> or I can have six, but I can't have five because that's the command. <laughs> So I guess what you're trying to say is that reading scripture with no context of the original culture in which it was written is a bad idea, which that that's a crazy concept. Well, it feels like malicious compliance at this point. You know, <laughs> I, I feel like you'd be surprised how much of Christianity is malicious compliance. Well, so this book is attributed to Solomon, the, the book of Proverbs, who is regarded as both an extremely wise man and as a prophet by Christians, by Jews, and by Muslims. Question is: Every word that comes out of a prophet's mouth basically the word of God. That that's that's the question here, because of course Solomon in the story he asks God for wisdom, and God is pleased that Solomon asks him for wisdom rather than asking him for riches or a long life. And so he's like, wisdom is a noble thing to desire. So yes, I'm going to grant your request. So does this mean, though, that every wise saying from Solomon is a wise saying from God because it came from a man whose unusual wisdom was granted to him by God as a gift? So every word that Solomon said would not be considered prophecy or the, or the word of God. What makes it a commandment and what makes it the word of God is is that it's in the canon of scripture. Like everything Solomon said was wise because he didn't have the human wisdom, he had God's wisdom. But what makes it a commandment is the canon is whether it made it into the Bible because the biblical literalist belief is that God not only spoke words to people with the intention that they would become scripture, but God also controlled what pieces of things that those people said were preserved because God's word is, in, in the biblical literalist view, God's word is complete. 
So anything that God said to that person that was meant to be in the Bible was preserved. And anything that he said to them that wasn't meant to be in the Bible or anything that they said that wasn't meant to be in the Bible didn't get preserved. And then God controlled what got into the canon of scripture and what didn't. Therefore, everything that made it into the canon was something that God personally chose, preserved, and approved. So what you're saying is that if it's a film, like all the all the prophets and all the people of Israel are actors, but God is the producer, director, writer, and editor. Right. So the bloopers didn't make it into the final film. No, not even like as like part of the end credits. Right. But uh, everything that the director wanted in the film made it into the film. So if it is in the film, it is exactly to the director's vision. And then in this analogy, the director also supervised as this film was translated from the original language into a different language and then also into a third language and then the director went back and recut the edition of the film that was translated into the third language so that it would be perfect Hmm. even though the director said i only cut this film once the director secretly came back around and supervised when it was redone in english so that everybody could still take it literally so so remember i talked about jack scobb's inspiration versus preservation thing that's the Jack Scott heresy that I just explained to you. I because you would think that he it would be like oh he designed it specifically so that it could be translated into other languages with no problem. Right. That's, that's but the that would make the more Jack Scott King James version inspiration heresy is that God came back down and re inspired the King James Bible so that it would be perfect in English, hmm. even though Scripture says that God spoke once. Well, you know how in Harry Potter, Professor Trelawney. Like she goes around making like 300 predictions a day and like it it could be like anything is like, what's the weather going to be like? And this is when you will die. (laughs) But then like sometimes she like freaks out and goes into a trance and makes an actual prophecy. Yes. And then those turn out to actually be right. Right. Like she, she is a legitimate seer and she does have the power to make actual predictions, but everything else she does is like a hundred percent wrong mostly except for like when it's right i guess i don't know that's what I, so like how so the, you're saying the difference between solomon giving like some really excellent advice and solomon giving a commandment is whether or not they decided to put it in the bible right because in the ifb world if it made it into the bible it's a commandment that's too much man that's like so uh, so like the only thing you have to determine is, is, was this commandment erased by the new covenant in Jesus, or does it still apply to me? Hmm. So all the things that the prophets told people to do, those are all commandments, and you have to figure out if they're meant for you or not. Commandments to specific people, also commandments to you in most cases. Like when God told Adam and Eve specifically, be fruitful and multi- multiply and fill the whole earth— They interpret that as a commandment for every Christian person now. That's one of the main verses that the Quiverful Movement is based on. So let me get this straight. So say a prophet came around now and was like a biblical prophet and said, wear a face mask for the spreading of disease is not pleasing to the Lord. But then the pandemic ended. Would the IFB still be wearing masks like in perpetuity for the rest of time because the Lord commanded it during a time when it was necessary? Yes, because to quote the New Testament, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance, which means that God never changes his mind, uh, except for like three times in the Bible when it's written down that God changed his mind. So once God Mm -hmm. commands something, you got to do it forever, except for that bit about not eating shrimp and bacon, apparently, but getting tattoos or being in a same gender relationship is still bad. Makes a lot of sense. And to go back to your face mask analogy, the IFB would probably not only wear face masks forever, they would also interpret that more and more strictly as time went on. So when the prophet first said it, like surgical masks would be okay. But the next generation, they would say, oh, we got to we got to get stricter as the world gets looser. So the next generation would be like a KN95. 
And then the next generation after that, it would be a KN95 and then a cloth face mask over that for modesty, like face modesty. Like pretty soon the IFB would just be like, well, they'd be wearing like full, that, that like full body hazmat suit. Well, right. Because it says it's for the spread, for the spread of disease. Mm-hmm. And huh, then they'd yeah, make up okay. a bunch of additional rules about things that they think spread disease. And then they would just keep spiraling off in that direction. They'd just be like a, 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 a cult of germaphobes. Yeah. And then it would uh, be, <laughs> man, my dad would have loved that more than he liked the IFB. <laughs> Man, you know, this reminds me, this reminds me of, you know, the challenge where you have one person who is blindfolded trying to instruct another person who is not blindfolded on how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Yes. Like the fundies are the people who are following the instructions, but being deliberately bad at it and then saying, well, this is what you told me to do. Fundies doing Judaism (laughs) badly since the 1800s, (laughs) probably before that. Yep. Yeah, I can't wait until we, we're going to do an episode on biblical literalism. Eventually, it's going to be so fun. So there are passages, I believe, in what Christians call the Old Testament that are clearly commandments. And regardless of your theology, I would argue that they're a good idea to follow. It's a good idea not to murder, to steal or kidnap, not to commit adultery, and not to covet. Those are just general general guidelines that I feel like are a good idea, even if you don't believe in God. Those are still pretty, pretty good things to do. But if you have this extremely literal black and white view of scripture and sin, and if you believe that so much of the Bible can be interpreted as commandments, then passages like Proverbs 31 can turn into something that can be used to make women feel bad about themselves. Because even though Proverbs 31 doesn't say, thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that, it still becomes construed as a standard that people, specifically women, should be held to. So I've heard this passage used to shame women for not being thin enough, for being gossips, not being a good cook, not making their own clothing, and to blame women for any personal failing that their husband might have. They take the verse... Her husband is known in the gates when he setteth among the elders of the land. And they take that to mean that a husband's success is dependent on a wife's virtue. So the way that that plays out in the IFB is that they will tell women, if you're lacking in some area, if you're not working hard enough, then your husband is not going to be successful at work, whatever his job is. And it's your fault. This reminds me a lot of those weird cause and effect diagrams from the IBLP advanced seminar yes like i want to know who who came up with these interpretations that's an interesting question i don't know for sure and i wouldn't say that the idea of if your husband is not having success in his career it's because you're failing as a wife behind the scenes is exclusive to the ifb but i do think it's localized to the ifb I've seen it in IBLP, IFB, Vision Forum type worlds far more than I've seen it outside those worlds. Although I have seen pieces of this ideology um, in like Tradcath type and uh, super strict complementarianism, patriarchal evangelical circles, I see it so much more in the IFB and closely related groups to the IFB. So it's not exclusive, but it's localized. I wonder if it goes back to the 1950s speed and Valium ideal of wifehood and motherhood. I I don't have evidence for this, but we know that the IFB is heavily inspired by the 50s and wants to go back there. So that would be my guess. Of course, the IFB expects you to be a speed and Valium wife without speed or Valium, which... Unfair. Yep, just getting high, getting high on Jesus instead. So, so this chapter, Proverbs 31, which is supposed to show an idealized version of femininity and give us all inspiration, is used instead, yet again, to blame the problems of men on women, which is gross, and I don't like it. Yeah, but that's like what the IFB, that's like their bread and butter. Yeah, uh, I, just, so- I just hate it. <laughs> yeah, so why don't we read through... Let's take a look at what the qualities are exemplified in a Proverbs 31 woman. So I memorized this as a teenager. I kind of want to see if I can still quote it. Oh, really? Yeah. You want to okay, see if okay. I can Which do it? You, you memorized it in KJV? Yeah, of course. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> what else? Yeah, what else? Know? Okay, so I'm starting with verse 10, and we're just going to see how far I get. Cool. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? The heart of her husband can safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She shall do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from the from afar. She rises also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considers a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. Mm. Okay, I have to I have to look at the the start of the next verse because this is when I start getting them out of order. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She rises rises or riseth. Uh, oh, I that's think not it's, the next no, it's one. Perceiveth. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. Okay, I think that's as far as I'm going to get today. Because that's I, still pretty good. I have all I have each verse memorized, but this is when I start really struggling to remember which one comes next. That's pretty good. I used to have the whole thing. If you were in theater class in high school with me, you would have had no problem memorizing your monologues, man. Oh That's... no, I, I never, I never did because I did mono- monologues for like a uh, fine arts competition. Yeah. Oh, that's really good though. So the IFB are out here saying that this is all 100% literal and all commandments. So they say that it's not just like the, she's worth more than jewels and she trusts her husband it's also she's got to be good at spinning thread like that comes up several times and she's got to be good at gardening and as an entrepreneur it's not considered a commandment because it's not saying thou shalt do this and god isn't Mm. telling someone to do it so it's a loophole that makes it's not an ifb sin if you don't spin your own thread or if you don't only wear purple silk clothing and thank goodness because if it said thou shalt, the IFB would make all of this commandments and that would have been even worse. So it's it's not it's not like, oh, you have to do every single thing in this passage, but they will shame you and try to bully you into doing whichever thing in this passage they think it is that you need to be doing. And it, it's highly suggested to hold yourself accountable to this passage of scripture. It's almost like a pageant, right? Where you have like different events and you have all the fundy women entering to be Miss Proverbs 31. And so you have to win like a gardening competition and an entrepreneurship competition and a thread spinning competition <laughs> and a real estate purchasing competition. So I Googled and- that. <laughs> And I was shocked to find out that the Proverbs 31 pageant is not a thing. I absolutely expected this to be a thing. New idea. Modesty pageants. (laughs) Judges. Yeah, they judge you while you wait behind a curtain or like maybe like a regular beauty pageant. But the judges are old church ladies who only complain about stuff. So So they're like, your neckline's too low. (laughs) Pretty sure this is a Patreon joke, but I was more envisioning um, it's a beauty pageant, but it's a panel of IFB preachers. And if anything about your outfit inadvertently turns any of them on, then you lose. <laughs> but this this pageant kind of sounds like the Mrs. America pageant. Have you heard of that? I thought they got like weirdos like Donald Trump to judge that. No, no, no. Mrs. America. It's not. It's oh. different from Miss America. Mrs. America is a beauty pageant for married women and they judge not only like your appearance but they judge a lot of cool homemaking skills like uh, like cooking sewing gardening hostessing ability i'm into a lot of these traditional homemaking skills as hobbies so it's interesting to me because of that so so what i want you to think about though is how being an ifb wife without the proverbs 31 pageant still has very strong pageant vibes. I want to explain this. So for a man to rise to a certain level of leadership in the IFB, for him to be in like a high staff position at Hiles Anderson or be pastor of a big established IFB church, he needs a wife that fits their very Stepford wife kind of mold. Pastor's wives especially, but also other leaders' wives, are under constant scrutiny and they're expected to be no less than perfect. Um, Beverly Hiles actually wrote a book about the pressures of being a pastor's wife. I think it's called Life is Viewed from the Goldfish Bowl because she felt like her entire life was under scrutiny, which knowing what I know now is pretty sad. 
You might remember a little of this from the Joe and Evangeline Combs episode as well, where we talked about how it was unusual that Evangeline didn't really live up to that expectation. She didn't participate in the social clubs and the activities and the image of a Hiles Anderson College high ranking staff wife the way that she was expected to. Yeah. And that was one of the main reasons why they were going to like why we were, I guess, hypothesizing that they wanted to get an off the books adopted child so that you could have somebody to like help around the house and like legit be enslaved. Yes, that is. I mean, we don't know what their motivations were, but that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So if you're an IFB preacher, having the type of wife like this type of wife, it isn't just like a necessity for your ministry. It's also like a status symbol. Am I getting that right? Yes, because there are so there are the must haves like she has to dress very modestly, but never look frumpy or out of style. She's got to have some kind of musical talent. Preferably, she can both play piano and has a great singing voice. She has to make motherhood look really effortless and she has to be a good public speaker. Maybe you can get away with like three out of the four of those characteristics. But you get all these bragging rights if she's not only got all that, but she also looks young for her age. She's thin. Double points if she has like six plus children and is still thin. And extra bragging points if she's good at homemaking skills like cooking, canning, home decoration. And also if she writes books that you can sell. I vividly remember Jack Scott bragging to no end about his wife's appearance. I also remember him basically negging her from the pulpit about his their home decor. He would talk about, oh, she's so good at decorating, but then he would go off on a rant about how all the little decorative pillows that she had annoyed him, how she made his house look too feminine. Well, in my personal opinion, excessive decorative pillows are at best tacky and at worst a nuisance. I agree. I don't I don't like them either, but I don't think that Jack Scott had any business embarrassing his wife in front of 10,000 people by complaining about her decorative pillows. Oh, absolutely. The, the issue with decorative pillows isn't that they're too feminine. It's that they're annoying. It's that, that they're like, not you practical. Go to, you, you go to sit on the couch and there's like this hard, lumpy thing. On the, and then like, where do you put it? Do you like throw it on the, the ground or you do you put it next to you on the couch? But then you can't use the whole couch. So you have like a pile of decorative pillows like on the floor, which is it's just not. Ugh. Anyway. I don't know. I, th- I think, I mean, I guess it's better than if they let Jack Scop decorate. Because, I mean, what would he have had? In- he-, he would have like a poster of like a Dodge Charger. You know, he d- he literally drove a Dodge Charger, right? That tracks. The Dodge Charger is the car for people who think that the police have too much accountability. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. If he decorated a house, he would try so hard to make it seem manly, but he would just end up seeming like fake and tacky. That man, just to trash Jack Scott because I can, that man tried so hard to be like a manly man, man. You know, he drove a muscle car and went hunting and he talked about construction all the time. But I don't I don't know if anybody else got this vibe. I always thought he was a giant fake. I just I think he felt like he had to portray this hyper masculine image because he didn't his physical appearance wasn't hyper masculine. He was he was more like a like a tall, lanky, thin I mean, he is, I assume, still. But he he didn't look hyper masculine just physically, and I think he felt like he had to compensate for that to appeal to hyper masculine IFB men. I mean, I'm sorry, toxic masculinity hurts everybody, and I'm sorry that men can't just be accepted for who they are, regardless of their appearance or how much masculinity they personally want to express but also i i don't feel that bad because it's jack scop and he deserves the worst yeah he's out here telling men that they have to be super masculine and that he can't even live up to that so he's got to pretend that's funny that that's like objectively funny yeah like i'm sorry (laughs) i am sorry that toxic masculinity hurts all men and usually i feel kind of bad for men who get caught up in that and feel like they can't express any part of their personality because of it but jack scop i do not care (laughs) you know what he probably put up if he was decorating his house he probably you know those pictures of ronald reagan and jesus with like an (laughs) m16 riding you know you see those on the on the internet oh yeah and he, he put that up right next to an age of consent countdown oh, no. clock for his favorite Hammond Baptist no, oh, high school student. Oh, burn. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. It <laughs> was a rough one. Uh, is it wrong, though? No. Did I lie? No, I just wish it was wrong. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, he's sex trafficked a minor who is a high school student at the school where he was. Uh, he wasn't the principal. Who's he was like the, the, the head. he would be the. I don't know if he was the dean the or dean? the chancellor. I don't know what his technical position was, but he was in charge of the school. Yeah, that's. I mean, then again, I guess I I guess we can go ahead and rag on him for that because this is the same man who said that he would put his wife in a fur coat and pimp her out in the back of a Cadillac to pay for the new church building if the church couldn't come up with enough money. So it's not like he was known for being either classy or respectful of his wife. I literally don't understand how people didn't realize earlier that this guy was a creep and a monster. That is f***ed up. I mean, it is. I I don't think I know any man of any religion who would say something like that about his wife or husband or partner. It's like some Charlie Sheen. Yes. You remember when those Charlie Sheen would say that those voice messages came out like, oh, man, he was just like saying, listen, I'm just saying you don't hear Lucian Graves saying that he is going to pimp out his partner against their consent if the satanic temple can't come up with enough money to build a new statue of the devil. Just saying Lucian Graves would never. No, I hate I hate the way that that Scott talked about his wife. Uh, I'm so glad that she left him and seems to be happy and doing okay. She did not deserve that kind of treatment. And I feel like, okay, um, this is a little bit of a sidebar, but I feel like it's another trauma bonding thing. I've talked about how I think that Scop traumatized teenagers on purpose with the sermon America, America. And then he sent us to lunch and then had us come back. And the next thing on the schedule was hearing the infamous polished shaft sermon. I think he did this on purpose. I think he knew that a group of traumatized and scared teenagers who had just heard about nuclear war would be a lot more receptive to the polished shaft. And I think that he disrespected Cindy from the pulpit for the same reason. I'll explain. The people of First Baptist Church of Hammond loved the Hiles family. These are people who did not leave the church through all the scandals of the 80s and 90s, and a lot of that was because they had a personal connection to Jack Hiles. They were grieving their pastor after he died, and they loved his family, especially Cindy, who was the youngest child, and she and Jack Hiles had a very close relationship. I think that Jack Scott disrespected these people's favorite pastor's favorite daughter as a way to flex his power. I can say whatever I want about whoever I want, even your beloved dead pastor's favorite daughter. That The fact that he has flexed that power makes him able to get away with saying more and more perverse things from the pulpit. I think what he actually got off on was being able to say lewd things from the pulpit. And I think that's how he accomplished that goal. Anyway, so that was my sidebar. I want to bring it back to the IFB thing about Proverbs 31, because we've u- we've talked about how it was used to shame women who didn't fit the IFB's arbitrary standards. But the other thing I want to talk about is how it was used to control women who did fit those arbitrary standards, because hmm. like everything in the IFB, it can be used to hurt women two different ways. When I was at Hiles Anderson, we were taught to almost worship the college staff wives and pastors wives, especially women who were married to pastors who had big churches, successful ministries. We were supposed to make them our mentors. We were supposed to find one or two of these women who were, you know, their husbands were on staff or they taught for the college or their husbands were on church staff or their husbands pastored big churches, whatever. We were supposed to find one or two of them to be our personal mentors, but we were supposed to emulate and follow pretty much anyone who fit those one of those positions. Have I ever told you uh, the story about what happened with a famous pastor's wife the night that I moved into the Hiles Anderson dorms? No. Oh, ma. No, oh, man. The story? Oh, man. Mm. Okay. This is a little bit of a longer story, but I promise that it's going somewhere. So I moved into Hiles Anderson dorms my freshman year of college, and my roommate was from one of these really big, well-established IFB churches. One of these churches that sends like dozens or hundreds of students to Hiles Anderson every year. My roommate was a really kind and sweet person, but she did not want to be at Hiles Anderson. 
it was really it was very clear that she had been pressured to go there by personally by this big name famous IFB preacher and his wife. So this is, she's like a one and done. Yes, she was. She was not. So it, like I had talked about with uh, Jonathan Mattingly being pressured to go to Hiles Anderson for just one year. And then like they're hoping that the kid will get sucked into the cult and end up going there for four years and become a pastor or missionary or whatever. It was that. My roommate, super nice girl, but she was not from a strict IFB family. And she was not prepared for the rules of Hiles Anderson. And she was not used to living a full 24-7 IFB lifestyle. <sighs> People really do God. get sent up there like, completely unprepared. And this happens every year at Hiles Anderson. I'm sure it still does. So Mr. Big Name Pastor and his wife brought my roommate to Hiles Anderson and they were helping her move in. And Mr. Big Name Pastor was going to be preaching the special evening service on the night, uh, the night of move in day, like the welcome to campus chapel service that they would have the night of the day that everybody moved into the dorms. So Mrs. Big Name Pastor comes back to the room with my new roommate they had gone out shopping and they came back and Mrs. Big Name Pastor is just so rude to me. She was just very dismissive and very cold to me. And I was caught off guard because I was so used to the wives of these big name pastors acting more like celebrities on camera, always being very gracious, sweet, having this very polished personality. Mm. And she was not so, behaving like that at all. Why, like, did she see something about you that she didn't like or? or At the time, I assumed that it was because I wasn't worth her time because my dad wasn't a big name IFB pastor. And mm. if I had, I mean, that, that was my perception at the time. I don't know. <laughs> Can't prove or disprove it. But that was what I thought. Huh. So she was in my dorm room, which is like being in someone's house. And she was, I, I don't, I do not know why she was being so snippy with me. But after all that, and she had kind of been treating me that way all day. And after all that, she saw my Bible lying on the table and she said, I need to borrow this. I didn't want her borrowing my Bible. It was a gift from my parents for my 16th birthday. I did not want to let somebody I didn't know who'd been rude to me all day take it, but I didn't I didn't feel like I could say no to someone of her standing. And th that's going to have all the signatures in it from every preacher you've ever asked to sign your Bible for like the past 2 years. Yeah, so it's a, it is a it's a personal item because it's your Bible, which is a big deal. It's also a sentimental item because my parents had given it to me and because of all the signatures, it's not really something you borrow. So she took my Bible mm. and we all went to the welcome to campus chapel service that night. I felt really weird going without my Bible because you're always supposed to have one. And I'm like, oh, great. Now everybody's judging me. Now everybody thinks I'm one of those. Just go to Hiles Anderson for one year. People who don't know what they're doing because now I look like a heathen because I'm not carrying my Bible. Anyway, her husband gets up to preach the sermon and he points down to his wife in the front row and he says something like, see my wife down there. She's such a great wife. She's always in the front row when I'm preaching and she always has her Bible with her and she always has her Bible open. Oh. And I'm just sitting somewhere in the back and that's my Bible. That's not her Bible. So after, after the chapel service, she didn't return my Bible immediately. I had to pester her and bother my roommate and... I, I don't remember how I got it back, but I know she didn't return it immediately. I think she returned it late the next day. She, so she did. I, my dorm was literally the closest one to the chapel and she didn't drop it by my room. I think I had to bother my roommate to get a hold of her to get it back. So did like did she like thank you for letting no. her borrow it? No, I don't think she returned it in person. She may have, but I think she left it in my room or had my roommate give it to me. I can't no remember. Note? Oh no. Or anything? Mm -mm. Mm. She was the big name big name pastor's wife. I felt like she thought that I should have been lucky to get to meet her and like it was some kind of honor for her to borrow my Bible. So then did she what did she sign your Bible before giving it back to you? Then? You know, I never checked carefully. <laughs> Not that I know of. It's somewhere in this closet that I'm sitting in. I should probably check. So so here's the thing. As rudely as this woman treated me, and as much as I personally dislike her based on our interactions throughout, not just that week, but that entire school year that, or that I was, well, it was a semester that I was roommates with a girl from her church because that 
that girl ended up dropping out of Hiles Anderson after a semester and I actually talked to her recently and she's got a great life now. So good for her. But I think this is an example like her her pastor's wife was really high pressure and just really caused her a lot of stress. And I think this is an example of how women are controlled regardless of whether they live up to an ideal or not. Because as as I've thought about this, I see it come up in discussion a lot about women who oppress other women within the cult. Mrs. Big Pastor's wife in the story I just told treated me badly. She was rude. She was awful. But her husband's positive compliment about her always being in the front row with her Bible open is the key to this story because that is a subtle form of control. She knew that he expected her to perform that behavior. And she probably knew that he was going to make that remark from the pulpit. And she knew that she'd be in trouble with him, either publicly or even privately. He could have actually abused her in private if she didn't have a Bible with her. I don't know what their relationship was like. I've seen plenty. I mean, I think the the milder option that was probably much more likely than him actually abusing her is something that I've seen plenty of pastors do. So pastors will say something about, look down here at my wife. She's always on the front row with her Bible open and a smile on her face. And then he'd say, oh, oops, it looks like she doesn't have her Bible today. She must be backsliding. And he would say it as a joke, mm. like it's meant to be a joke. And it would get a big laugh. It's not, uh, it's not actually a judgment of... We're not meant to think that his wife is literally backsliding because, again, she's a celebrity-like figure who never backslides because she's a perfect pastor's wife. So it, it's a joke. But who wants a joke made at their expense in front of thousands of people? Who wants their spouse to make that joke when they have no opportunity for retaliation or self-defense? Because remember, women are to be quiet in church. If she yelled something back at him, even as a joke, that would be a major social faux pas. Of course, it's possible that he would have actually gotten angry with her in private if she didn't have a Bible with her. I don't have a lot of information about their personal life, so I don't want to speculate on that too much. So he's using this public humiliation as like a control technique. Right. And it's everywhere in mm. the IFB because jokes are never just jokes in the IFB. And what seems relatively small from the outside can be a really big deal. Yeah. Oh, like when, you know, like when your friends are roasting you and they start hounding like you on something that they know you're sensitive about. And then when you get upset about it, they act like you're the one who's wrong and like, oh, why are you so sensitive? You know? Yeah. I mean, those don't yeah. sound like very good friends to me. Oh, no. But there's but it it is kind of like that. There is some text and control behind a lot of jokes in the IFB. I'm thinking of uh, maybe a more famous clip. There's a clip of Jack Hiles at pastor school um, one year. I think it was in the early 90s when they rented out the Hammond, Hammond Civic Center, which they used to do for pastor school when they expected a crowd that the auditorium wouldn't hold. Hiles is talking about some guy on his staff and the guy I think was Mexican or maybe Puerto Rican. But Hiles makes some racist joke about how he's lazy. The subtext on that one is incredible. It's mm. praise and humiliation at the same time. Hiles. So on one hand, he's praising this guy for something that he did at the church and being praised. So Hiles, it's like a backhanded compliment. He says something about him being lazy and then turns it around and, oh, no, no, brother. So and so he's a great worker. I'm just I'm just joking with him. Being praised by name in front of pastor school is the big leagues. That's about the best thing you're ever going to get from Jack Hiles, unless he's buying you fur coats with church money. But also, he's being overtly racist and calling you lazy in front of all of those people as well. So it's this weird mix of like praise and backhanded compliments and insults. And it's like a drug. <laughs> Cult leaders do this all the time. It's like negging. It is exactly the same principle as negging. It's a psychological principle that works. So to bring this back to my story, why was Biz why was Mrs. Big Name Pastor so rude to me? And why did she feel like she could just commandeer my Bible? Was she aware that she was using her slightly less oppressed status to make my life worse? No, I don't think so. I don't think she had any conscious thought that she was stepping on me to make her own status slightly better. I think she was anxious about presenting herself as this perfect pastor's wife 
She knew that she had these very high expectations on her and she had to live up to them. And I think she felt like taking my Bible was maybe survival mode. She was clearly stressed, but just based on the way that she was treating me that entire day, it doesn't excuse her behavior. But I think it's a good insight into that question of the like, what about the Aunt Lydia's of the IFB world, the women who oppress other women and keep them in line or the women who step on other women to get ahead? I think that this story kind of gives a perspective on that. Is this so is this like sort of embarrassment thing? This is this where like this my smoking hot wife trope comes from? Yeah, I think it's absolutely. Yeah, it's related. Yeah. So how how common is that, though? How common is it to hear a pastor say something like like refer to his wife as like the smoking hot wife? OK, uh, the actual phrase smoking hot wife was definitely a thing I heard here and there. It was absolutely used unironically, but it's not like a daily thing, not like every sermon. IFB preachers referring to their wives' physical attractiveness was more of an every sermon thing if he was one of the guys who did that. So you and you have a lot of guys that it's a lot more innocent. It's like, oh, my beautiful wife or my lovely wife, which is fairly normal. I mean, I think that's a thing that anybody in a relationship might do. But I also heard a lot of more sexual references from certain pastors. From the pulpit? Oh, yeah. Like like what? Okay, so Jack like, Scop in particular, back to him again, was definitely uh, not above making comments on his wife's sexual performance. I don't have a direct quote on hand, but I'm going to give you an example of something similar, something he might say like a very close paraphrase. So he might say something like, you young preacher boys, you want a wife who's beautiful, who's godly, who's going to be a great mother to your children, and he and she's also good in bed? Well, you better pray and fast. You better work hard for God, and then God will give you all that because that's what I have. And then I'm not going to, and I'm not going to imitate like where he would go from there because it makes me feel really gross, but he'd probably make some vaguely sexual noises or like mildly sexual gestures or something. Ew. Yes. Ew. Yes. Yeah. Ew. <laughs> Do, I, I find it so ironic that these are the types of people who would say that rap music is terrible because it's degrading to women and then they're going to pull this shit. That's dead on. Yeah. And and I think this goes back to something that I keep on saying. I feel like a broken record a little bit because I feel like this comes up like every fourth episode. But a compliment is not a compliment in the IFB. Because Cindy Scott, just to continue kind of breaking this concept down, Cindy Scott at the time had the absolute highest position a woman could hold in the IFB. She had the absolute best life an IFB woman was allowed to have. And her husband could compliment and praise her in front of more people than any other husband in the IFB. Everybody likes to be praised by their partner. But when Jack Scopp had an opportunity to praise his wife in front of the largest audience available, he chose to do it in a way that is so backhanded, so crass, and so embarrassing that it's not a real compliment at all. What it is, is a means of control and putting her in her place. It is underlining his view of her as his property and it is enforcing these expectations that he has of her i wasn't best friends with her but she was one of my college teachers and i interacted with her quite a bit oh through the years and she was a uh, personal friends to my parents i am certain from what i know of her that she did not enjoy references to her sex life being made on literally a national stage so at what point does praise in public become an expectation in private so if he says i told everyone how dutiful of a wife you are are you going to make a liar out of me i think that that definitely happens in some relationships overtly like if a wife has a headache the husband's gotten up in front of his entire congregation of hundreds or maybe even thousands of people and said, well, my wife never turns me down for sex. And then he can use that to pressure her to have sex when she's not feeling it. I think that is a thing that does happen in some relationships. I think maybe more common is that the wife in the situation puts that pressure on herself. Like she's got a headache. He wants to have sex and she's thinking to herself, Well, my husband said in front of all those people that I never turn him down, that's his expectation and I can't make a liar out of him. So it never even comes out of either one of their mouths. She is just put into that situation where she feels like she has to enforce it on herself. 
so it like is my wife never turns me down for se- like that like explicitly stated is that the type of thing an ifb preacher would actually say from the pulpit <laughs> oh it's so funny that you have to ask that <laughs> no like literally all the time like some what? yeah some preachers will say sex a lot of preachers won't a lot of preachers will euphemize but to say like my wife never turns me down is absolutely a thing that i have preachers would say that's what that oh, a of all that is extremely private what the hell like so, so you could have an ifb preacher get up there as part of his sermon and say I call my wife Dumbledore because she's the headmaster. And the only objectionable parts of that would be that Dumbledore is a gay wizard from a fantasy story, which is obviously satanic. And as we discussed from our Valentine's Day episode, that oral sex is highly discouraged. But other than that, it's fine. Yeah. I wouldn't see, what? like I said, I would not see most IFB preachers being that graphic. The graphicness of that statement is, I would, I would expect that from the the um in IFB more than the IFB. So IFB preachers, like old school IFB, would probably quote something from Song of Solomon and like insinuate, kind of wink, wink their way to the same conclusion, because the idea is to make sure that the adults know what you're talking about, but it goes over the kids' heads. But yes, it is totally common for IFB pastors to brag about their sex lives or their wives' sexual performance. God. So this was supposed to be our light and fluffy Mother's Day episode. Oops. This is the you know that scene in I Love You Man? You've seen I Love You Man, right? I don't right? think so. Okay, never mind. I won't I well, well no. since since we've gone to the dark place again, uh, uh what do you say we go take up the offering, we'll give you a minute to reset your brain, and then we'll come back and we'll go back to Proverbs thirty one because I want to do I want to go verse by verse and talk about like the IFB interpretation of it. And then for some verses, I have a little more of a feminist read that I think our listeners might enjoy. Okay, that sounds great. Let's do that. Let's do it. Hey, Sadie here. If this is your first time listening to the Leaving Eden podcast, make sure you go back and check out episode 57. It's a primer episode for new listeners. That episode tells my personal story and gives you all the terms and information that you'll need to know going forward. Also, check out our cult true crime series, The First Family of Fundamentalism, so that you can get the whole cult story. If you like our show, you can support us by joining our Patreon, where we have extended and uncensored episodes, as well as other bonus content available. You can also join in the discussion in our Facebook group, that group is called Eden Exodus. Tell a friend, tell a family member, tell your worst enemy. The Leaving Eden podcast is a fully independent podcast, and we really appreciate your support. Now, back to the show. We are back from our break. We are talking about Proverbs 31. We are going to break this down. Sadie, tell us how we're going to break this down. Woo! So on this special Deconstruction Live episode... <laughs> Uh, I thought it might be nice. So we're going to pick some verses from Proverbs 31. I've picked out the verses that I remember the IFB's specific interpretation and application of. Uh, We'll read the verse. We'll give the IFB interpretation. And then if I have opinions about a feminist read of this verse or a modernized read of of this verse, then I'll give you my thoughts on it. Yeah. Sadie, we're doing Sadie. Is, that's not theology. It's Sadieology again. <laughs> yeah. This is um, just all foundation for when I start my own cult. I, I couldn't see you as a cult leader. You couldn't be that controlling. I can't see you as being that controlling after being through what you've been through. Uh, I know. It's a real shame. It's a real shame. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be good at it, but I, yes. <laughs> let's, let's go. Okay. Let's do this. So uh, I do want to note again that Proverbs is one of the poetic books. So when the IFB reads this, they seem to treat it as a standard to live up to. But when I read it, I'm seeing poetry and I'm seeing a lot of metaphor. In modern speak, this is goals. So let's jump in with verse 11. And I'm I'm reading from King James uh, just because that's what I'm super familiar with. But if, you know, anyway, I'm starting with verse 11. The heart of her husband can safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. 
the IFB okay. read on verse 11 is her husband can trust her to do things like moderate his Covenant Eyes subscription and not go over budget <laughs> at the grocery store. If they really trust each other, then why does why does he even have a Covenant Eyes subscription? Well, duh, it doesn't say the wife has to trust the husband. <laughs> right, because men are insatiable and therefore never trustworthy. Right. And it's women's job to moderate and appease men's emotions. Uh, the feminist read of mm. verse 11, I would say, is that she is trustworthy because that's what it says. <laughs> okay. That's very basic. I love how the IFB, if you're a woman in the IF, I don't, I, I don't want to say I love how the I, that came out wrong. <laughs> if you're in the IFB and you have two children, then you are really parenting three people. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's. Hmm. That was that's that is accurate. Okay. So verse 13 is she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. The IFB read of that verse would be she likes housework and she's always willing to do more housework. But that's not literally what it says. What does it say about wool and flax? She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. So my my read of that verse would be she's handy around the house. She knows how to do things. She's crafty. She's crafty. That's a great way of saying it. But like in a in in like a, a artistic like arts and crafts way, not like in a Beastie Boys she's crafty kind of way. Exactly. So uh, let's see. Moving on to verse fourteen, she is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. The IFB read is again that she's a thrifty grocery shopper. And yes, I know I already mentioned this. Grocery shopping can take up a lot of time and energy when you have a lot of kids and no money. Why can't I have no kids and three money? I just want to say that I love grocery shopping. And uh, if my future smoking hot wife is listening, don't worry about this one. I'll handle the grocery shopping. I literally love doing it. <laughs> So if you want to see this in action, you can see the detailed work that Susanna Anderson puts into feeding her family. Uh, if she does, in fact, feed them as much as she as much as she says that she does, which is contested. Are you saying that people sometimes lie on the Internet for uh, cred? I have heard that this does happen. No way. I <laughs> Man, the the breakthrough revelations that have come out of this episode uh, no read way. the Bible in context of the culture and the time in which it was written. And sometimes people lie on the Internet. We are learning new things today. Brand new things. I don't think anyone's Brand ever new. said that before. Woo. I do want to say, though, so this is this is the deconstruction live portion of our show. There are a lot of factors that influenced me in the area of like meal planning, grocery shopping. Part of it was just growing up poor. That with nothing to do with religion specifically. But also, this is such a highly gendered thing in the IFB that when I got out, I rebelled against it and didn't want to learn how to cook well. I did not want to be an efficient meal planner. I did not want to be good at grocery shopping or any of that because it was it was such a gendered expectation that I really wanted to just rebel against it. It turns out that I'm actually pretty good at it. So the feminist reading, the more the modernized reading of she brings her food from afar, couldn't you interpret this as she feeds her household a varied and healthy diet and she's educated on how to cook lots of types of food? Like mm -hmm. if you think about it, when we eat a large variety of things, we get all the nutrients that we need, but not all of those foods are grown in our local area. So we're bringing our foods from afar when we do that. So what you're saying is she's vegan and eats hella lentils and quinoa. Um, kind of, yeah. Yeah, but she isn't about that locally grown life. So, Well, the ideal person sources a variety of healthy foods for their family. I know okay, since fair. I've had yeah. yeah, and I know since I've had a baby, I've been branching out and trying to get more variety into our diet because I want her to grow up enjoying lots of different foods and I've learned to cook new vegetables. Like I don't think I ever cooked a parsnip before I had a baby. I've learned mm. um and also I don't think I ever knew how amazing roasted acorn squash is. All I'm saying is in a few years nobody's gonna be eating animal meat. It's gonna be like robot meat 
You know what I'm saying? Robot meat. <laughs> yes, because you've been telling me about it for like I've a week te- now. Yeah, it's the fake meat that they make from pea and soybean proteins that they're going to make in a 3D printer to replicate the mouthfeel of meat from animals. Mark my words, also expect this to be the new angle for the culture war because it's going to be people who eat meat from animals versus people who eat meat from robot meat. Hey, I'm all about that robot meat. Robot meat is where it's at. (laughs) So let's, okay, moving on to verse 15. She rises also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. Robot meat. (laughs) The, The IFB read of that verse is that she gets up early and is an effective household manager. And I think that the feminist read could just be that she's a go getter and she's a good employer or boss because she's taking care of people who work for her. You could also read that as uh, she is mentoring younger women in their professional development. Uh, She goes out and buys lunch for her appropriately paid interns. Yes. And she uh, and she she has sessions with them where she talks about their career development and uh, future opportunities. Solid stuff. That's what we like to see. So hold on to that getting up early thing because I'm going to come back to that. Mm -hmm. But for now, let's go to verse 16. She considers a field and buyeth it, and with the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. The IFB like to skim over this verse, or they'll say it's about having a garden to grow food for your family, because they don't like to think about women owning property. I've also heard people say, I have, and this isn't the mainstream IFB read at all, but I have heard people say that she was scouting for her husband's real estate business, and she found the property, and then he bought it. Which is complete bullshit and not what the scripture says. So I think it's funny that the fundies are people who take everything in the Bible completely literally, except for when something contradicts their literal patriarchy. And then they just say, well, (laughs) obviously they didn't mean it like that. Yes, so true. (laughs) So the the feminist read of this verse is once again exactly what the verse says. She bought an undeveloped retail space and opened a small business. (laughs) Full stop. (laughs) Like she bought a field and then made it a vineyard and she did it on her own with the fruit of her own hands. Why don't the fundies go for this sort of... Inter- like they could say, "Oh, my wife runs an Etsy shop. That's a pro. That's Proverbs thirty one enough for me. Like that's fine, you know." So do that. IBLP women, and this is this is one place that the IFB and the IBLP diverge a little bit more because IBLP women in particular are definitely encouraged to have small businesses, especially Etsy or MLM type stuff, but also. I think it said in the advanced training manual that we read some suggested businesses were selling baked goods, sewing for people, babysitting, if it doesn't interfere with her raising her own quiver full of kids. IFB women are heavily into MLMs, and it's almost hard to find one who isn't involved in one. The difference here is that the IFB has to make it into something that her husband finances and allows, not something that she fully owns and built on her own. And and I don't see a lot of IFB churches being supportive of a woman owning property in her name that doesn't have her husband's name on it. I mean, this is the same group that doesn't encourage that they they tell women don't have a bank account that doesn't have your husband as a co-signer. Yeah. Oof, yikes. Bad yeah. idea. That is that is a super bad idea. That is such a bad idea. Yeah. Have your have have your own bank account with your own little emergency fund in it. Period. Um, okay. Verse 17. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. So I'm going to kind of show my ass here a little bit. What does girdeth mean? You don't know this? No. I, I've read, like, I've read, I don't know what this word means. I've read this whole book. I don't know what this word means. Girdeth. So, I've okay. heard this word literally nowhere else. And every time I see it, I'm like, I wonder what that means. And then I don't look it up. <laughs> oh, okay. So I think I can paint you a, a word picture here. So this is biblical times. Men wore robes. According to the IFB, men's robes were knee length while women's were floor length. I don't know if that's accurate or if that's just IFB retconning scripture again. Oh, to make the women's robes modest enough well to, to make to make sure that there was a differentiation between men's garments and women's garments so that they can still make women not wear pants uh, uh-huh. yeah mm. because the whole the whole idea is that if women don't wear pants then 
you can tell if the person who is walk you can tell the gender of the person who is walking towards you even from a long distance away and they have to oh. retcon scripture to make sure that that was the case in scripture as well does that make Damn more it. sense why they're trying to like do genital checks on people who need to go to the bathroom now that you know that uh, <laughs> yeah that, okay. i hate that so much why? yeah but that's that's like a, that's yeah okay so what is actually accurate what i do know is accurate though as far as girding when men would work in fields or go to battle they didn't want the robe weighing them down or getting in the way so basically what you would do is you would reach between your legs pull the back part of the robe up between your legs to the front like to your belly button and then you tie that front part up with you tie the back part up with the front part of the robe. It ends up looking like halfway between shorts and like an old school cloth diaper. Does that make sense? Yeah. You tie okay. it up to like basically make shorts. The Bible talks about girding so often, but that's how it's that's how it's done. So when it says that she girdeth her loins, that just means that she's f***ing yoked and always prepared for battle. So let that- me give you the IFB <laughs> read first, because this is going to make you mad. Okay. The mm. IFB read of this verse is that she stays thin for her husband. What? Yeah. How do you get from point A to point B there? I, I'm genuinely curious. It's like misogyny. A, this is like a Bill Gothard. Uh, 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 what is it? <laughs> leads to insanity. What, what was it that leads to insanity? Something. Uh, 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 a divided mind. A divided mind leads being to indecisive. In- being indecisive leads to insanity. That's what it was. I think. It, yeah, being indecisive means a divided mind. Divided mind leads to insanity. Insanity leads to suicide. So if you're indecided, you'll kill yourself. Indecisive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so so the, the feminist read of this, I think, is pretty obvious that, that she's physically and mentally strong. Mm. Also, I do want to point out that girding in the Bible is a specifically masculine thing to do. In this verse, it's it's fully metaphorical. She's girding her loins metaphorically with strength, not literally with a garment. But this is using a directly, incontrovertibly masculine metaphor to describe her physical strength, which I, I think is pretty cool. I'm genuinely curious. How does she... How does she girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms get to she stays thin for her husband? Like... That misogyny. How, how? How? How does that mean that those? How? That doesn't. Th- that those are different words and they're not connected in any reasonable way. It doesn't have to make sense for the IFB to use it to body shame people. Were they high? Obviously not, because they're IFB. That's that's the more upsetting thing. If they were high <laughs> when they came up with this, I would be more. I would be like, okay, they're just smoking a bunch of weed, and they thought, no, what what you what you need, you, you, what what Proverbs thirty one really says is that a, a Proverbs thirty one woman does CrossFit. Uh, you heard it here first. Her biceps are extremely well defined. She could arm wrestle the f- out of you and like smash your knuckles on the table like that. Uh, yeah, she's strong. Yeah. Uh, the the <laughs> modern, if you want to go like super super progressive, the modern verse might say uh, she makes strength and physical health a priority to the best of her ability. What does the message say in in this? I can look it up. Yeah, look Proverbs it up. Thirty one seventeen message. Yeah, that's the the um the low key cringe hello fellow youths version of the Bible. But it's not. It's not like the 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 super cringe one that refers to God as Cap G. That's the predecessor. Okay, Proverbs thirty one seventeen. The message: First thing in the morning, she dresses for work, rolls up her sleeves, eager to get started. Uh, that's that's also. I don't like that either. That does. That also doesn't work. That also is like completely I, different meaning. I I hmm. agree with the paraphrase in context of the rest of the chapter. I don't like that interpretation of that specific verse. No. I think that phrase belongs in this chapter that's very consistent with the person that's being described here. I think that particular verse is about physical strength. I like I all I'm saying is that we need to to get rid of we, we need to not get rid of the the verses that glamorize like just a a, a woman with extreme biceps that I I think I don't know where I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> 
Let's go to verse 18 before we get too far off. Verse 18. Okay, Okay, cool. Uh, Verse 18 in back in the King James. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. So the IFB read, this is where I'm coming back to. Remember, I said something about keep your eye on this verse that says she gets up early. This is this combined with that other verse is where I have seen the sleep deprivation that I've talked about in the IFB really get perpetuated on two women. It's an element of control that's often used by cults, and the IFB is no exception. Oh, and a lot of moms, as a caveat, a lot of moms and a lot of primary parents of all genders feel like we get up early and then we stay up late just to get a few minutes of free time. And that's pretty ingrained in society. That's not exclusive to the IFB way of life. But... When the IFB is prescribing that you do it, that you stay up, get up early and stay up late to get all the chores done or to make sure that you have sex with your husband so that he doesn't leave you, that's behavior control because sleep deprivation makes you easier to control and more compliant. Yikes. So the feminist read, of course, the IFB likes to overlook the merchandise is good part because that backs up that not only is this person a business owner, but also her work is good. She's proud of what she's done and what she's made. So uh, thus far in the IFB, uh, we've got a, a Proverbs 31 woman is an emaciated and sleep deprived woman who is happy to do housework all day and be a nanny to her idiot and sex obsessed husband and is also randomly the surveyor <laughs> in all of his real estate dealings. Yes, and she's happy and joyful through all of it, never complains, lets her husband take the credit for her hard work, and she's never too tired for hot sex at the end of the day. Uh, right. No. Okay, I'm going to breeze through a couple more verses, um, IFB read and feminist read. Cool. So I'm skipping to verse 20. Again, I'm picking out the ones that I definitely remember the IFB interpretation of. So verse 20, she stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. I feel like this is the one place where the IFB reading and the feminist or modern reading are probably the same, uh, by which I mean the IFB has not figured out a way to make this one awful. The interpretation is that she's charitable and she feels feels fulfilled when she helps others. The IFB could, if they wanted to make this terrible, says that she tithes 15 percent, 20, 25 percent to her church. <laughs> well, she'd have to have money to tithe. That's It's all true. her husband's money. And you can't tell your husband what to do. So you can't make your husband tithe more. Mm, makes sense. And you have no bargaining chips in your marriage because you can't even say, I'll have more sex with you if you tithe more because your husband's already getting it literally whenever he wants, no matter how you feel. Wow. And I did it again, didn't I? Damn, you triggered yourself. <laughs> that was... Come trigger uh... yourself. Well in. Come trigger yourself. We're on the podcast. <laughs> Come trigger yourself. Something, something. We need to... That one... <laughs> we, need a, we need a soundboard, Gavi. I've been begging you for a soundboard. Um <laughs> So I thought you were the musical theater one. You know, we got to we got to keep it fresh for our audience. Yeah, (laughs) that one wasn't so bad because at least I don't have memories of an IFB marriage. I only have memories of being prepared for an IFB marriage starting it when I was like 11. Thank God. Uh, Okay, so verse, let's see, verse 23, her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. The IFB reading to this verse is kind of key because the the interpretation that they give is that if this person, if this woman does all of the work and she does all of this well, her husband will find favor in business or in politics. And if he starts a business or runs a political campaign and he doesn't have success, it is likely because she was falling down on the job somewhere. And this is this is a thing that comes up over and over and over again. Like we've talked about this so many times. If like if if your husband has a problem, it's probably your fault as the wife. I feel like I feel like every IFB wife is like the portrait of Dorian Gray and every husband in the IFB is Dorian Gray. Yeah, that kind of works. I don't think I've read it, but I know I've read like the cliff notes when I was trying to get educated on things. I read the cliff notes to a lot of classics on my way out of the IFB because <laughs> that's because, you know, like as you do. 
I think that's a, a good analogy because things that IFB husbands do can have consequences for them, but they are like always more likely to have consequences for the wife and they're always more likely to have worse consequences for the wife. So <clears throat> the the f- and then this is this goes back to what we were talking about with Eric. You cannot get so caught up in like the men versus women thing that you forget how much the IFB harms men because it does. Um you you can't get so hyper focused on all of the many many ways that it harmed w- women that you overlook the harm that it did to men but you also have to have this balanced view of yes it was terrible for men but it was always one step worse for women if not multiple steps worse and and there's i I loved that conversation with eric because i feel like we were trying to find that balance the way that i've sort of kind of seen it the way that i think about it is that like if you're a wife and you up then it's bad for you and if you're a husband and you fuck up, it's bad for you. But if you're a husband and your wife fucks up, that's not really your problem. But if you're a wife and your husband fucks up, that's definitely your problem. Mm-hmm. And people are going to blame it at least 50% on you as the wife. Yeah. Oh, this so, sucks. So I think, I feel like that's why that, that's why I was so invested in that conversation with Eric because finding that balance, I think, is really key to helping people of all genders. Mm deconstruct and work through this so the feminist reading of her husband being known in the gates is that i mean my interpretation is her husband is off doing his own thing he also has an important job she's taking care of her he's taking care of his true power couple like jay-z and beyonce yeah so i have a couple more verses Verse 26, she openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. The IFB read is that she keeps sweet and she's never negative in any way. Uh, the feminist read would be she's a fucking nice person. She doesn't say mean shit to people. Yeah. <laughs> Which, again, seems pretty obvious. That seems much more reasonable than... The- yeah, and, like, possible. Because this passage isn't meant to be you're not worthy or you're not okay if you don't live up to every part of it that's not in my opinion the intention of this passage it's goals and but if if it is something that you're meant to look to as aspirational and you're meant to oh i can work on that thing or i can work on this thing and i can be a little bit more ideal if it's meant to be like a personal development thing being a nice person who doesn't say mean to people is so much more achievable then she then be a person who is never negative and never ever say anything even mildly negative like it's cold in here yeah so uh let's see verse 27 oh, God. she looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness the ifb read is that she is always busy She's never lazy, and she doesn't even seem to have time to rest. She accounts for every moment of her day, and she doesn't, quote-unquote, waste time on self-care or rest. That is horrible and torturous just thinking about it. Ugh. It is. I mean, mm. it is. God. It is, because in, in the IFB, I, I made a TikTok about this recently. In the IFB, time that you don't plan for or time that you don't have scheduled out is an opportunity to sin. And that includes rest. And next week's episode, um, actually, what we're talking about is we're talking about something directly related to that. We're actually doing a day in the life of um, an IFB uh, fundy person. That was suggested by a Facebook group member and people really seemed interested. So I'm I'm excited about that one. It's going to be a lot of fun. But yeah, it's like... So we've gotten through writing like half of it. And I think Gavi's already exhausted just by hearing about my days <sighs> in the IFB. Yeah, it's nuts. It's unbelievable. Oof. So that's like, that's the IFB interpretation of Edith not the bread of idleness. My more like modernized or feminist interpretation would be she doesn't enjoy extended periods of idleness or laziness. And when I think eating, eating the bread of idleness suggests to me that that's a, like, it's a habitual thing. Like eating bread would, especially looking at this time in history, that is like your daily food. That's your daily sustenance. Like her, she doesn't continually and habitually be idle or lazy. 
she her it's not her jam to just have nothing to do she prefers to keep herself busy it is nothing to do with not taking time for self-care or not taking time for rest to me this i would see this more as like oh this is someone who uses her time well both for work and personal time that's that's a healthy attitude though Mm just like yeah yeah and i'm all about like taking these I hope I hope this has been good for people because to me this is taking verses that have been used to beat me over the head with and finding something useful in them. Like hey IFB you can't take away my ability to get something good out of this scripture. It's something that's like not being used to hit me over the head with. Okay, I have one more verse and this is going to kind of sew it up I think. On air deconstruction right here baby. Yes. Right here. And I hope that's helpful to other people because it sure is to me. I think you seem to have a good idea of of what people find helpful and like it. You have your finger on that pulse pretty well. I try. Yeah. I try. <laughs> okay. So verse 30, and this one is one that gets quoted a whole bunch. Uh, Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. The IFB interpretation is Mm. women don't need to worry about being beautiful to anyone but their husbands. Women should magically look perfect all the time without spending much time or money on themselves. Reading the Bible will magically make you look pretty. Yes, I was really told this. Really? Yes. What? (laughs) What? Yes. Uh, Like, if you read the Bible and pray a lot, you will have a glow and you will naturally look and appear more beautiful. Is this like the Bill Gothard? uh, High key magical thinking. Like, if you're if you're a virgin, then you have the light in your eyes. It's exactly Uh, it's the same concept. Yeah. yeah. And but it's an impossible double standard because it's it's look amazing all the time. Look sexy for your husband but also look sexy for your husband while not looking good enough to tempt other men. But keep it tight and wear makeup for your husband, but don't spend much time or money on that. You could get a makeup gun. Yes, you need a Marge Simpson makeup <laughs> gun to make this work. But do you feel like that is that is not possible? I, I'm yeah. I'm into makeup as a hobby, and looking super great with makeup is is not something that you do without time and money. It's not that, you know, it's not that you have to spend thousands of dollars or hours and hours, but it takes time to practice makeup skills. It takes time to apply it nicely. And you're not going to look the same with eyeshadow that you spent $1 on at the dollar store or eyeshadow that you bought for 50 bucks at Sephora, period. It just it doesn't happen. So what's the feminist read on this? So my feminist read on this passage is that beauty standards are bullshit and you're never going to be happy with how you look if you're comparing yourself to someone who spent thousands of dollars to look a certain way and then still Photoshop the hell out of their picture. There is nothing wrong with trying to customize your appearance that you're in a way that you're happy with it. But there are much bigger things in life and your character ultimately outweighs your appearance. I do not know how somebody could look at this text and come up with two interpretations that are so divergent from each other. The the, the IFB read on this is so specific to 20th century United States and not at all applicable whatsoever to biblical Israel 2,900 years ago when this was like written down so that's the thing on scripture interpretation right people are trying to take a poem about an idealized woman from ancient times and then make it applicable to today i would point out that the ifb interpretation and the feminist interpretation that i gave you are actually both trying to do the same thing they're they're taking this poem and telling you what they get out of it It's just that the IFB interpretation is trying to make it into a list of standards that they can use to further control or shame women. And I'm trying to make it into a personal development tool. How I see the IFB, though, is that they decide what their version of the idealized woman is beforehand. And then they look at Proverbs 31 and they're just like, well, how do we get from how point do we a get to get our yeah. interpretation out of that yeah that's that's exactly what this seems because a lot of these interpretations don't make any f-ing sense whatsoever it's like utter nonsense and anybody like i don't care if you're ifb and you're listening to this and you are listening to that interpretation and you think that that's right i think you're a f-ing idiot <laughs>
I, I, I don't know, man. Uh. Yeah, I think the thing that that you have that you want to be mindful of when you are looking at this through twentieth century progressive feminist eyes is that it wasn't written for me any more than it was written for the IFB. It was written for biblical Israel twenty nine hundred years ago. So I think I have to be mindful about not being. Oh well, the Bible said the Bible says this. Um, I I try more just to look at it as inspiration, not a list of literal rules. Because, like I said earlier in earlier in this episode, there are parts of the Bible that I think are completely safe to take one hundred percent literally. The part where it says not to murder, uh, I take that one hundred percent literally as a rule for my life that I fully intend to live by forever. But not just because the Bible says so. That's true. That's that's true. There are other fact, very important factors like my moral compass and my desire not to go to jail that also weigh into my decision to take that completely literally. But for me, I do get so this is what I am saying when I say that I get good out of scripture. Uh, this this chapter, I read it as what it is, which is poetry, ancient poetry, and then I can get inspired by it. Like, hey, I read this super old poem and then something in it made me want to keep growing as a person. And that is one way of several ways that I continue to get value out of scripture and religion. Of course, in the IFB, if something about your interpretation doesn't make any sense in the time of Solomon, then you can just retcon and say it's prophecy meant for now times. And it wasn't meant for the ears of the people in the time that it was written because it was really intended to be heard in English and KJV English. So true. Yeah. It's so true. Make it make okay. sense. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of trying to make the IFB made, make sense, what I want to do instead is I'd like to finish off this episode with a little bit of fun. Let's this do is more a treat for me personally than anything else. But I hope our listeners will enjoy it. I would like to finish this one by proving that if there is a Proverbs 31 woman alive today in 2022, she is none other than Michelle Obama. Woo! Just like just to make the fundies mad, just because I find this fun. Okay. Yeah. If if you if you said that Michelle Obama was a Proverbs 31 woman while still in the fun man, oh, they so, wouldn't like that. I'm just I'm going to breeze through the chapter and I'm going to point out the places where I see this being especially relevant. Okay, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband can safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. Never heard a whisper of a rumor about Michelle Obama's fidelity. Okay, she shall do him good and not evil all the days of her life. I think that in, in my opinion, I think that Michelle is an asset to her husband, both personally and in his career. So I think she does him good and not evil. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. I'm coming back to this one. So just bookmark that. Cool. She is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She rises also, also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. Now, it's interesting that this passage, Proverbs 31, mentions food so often when Michelle was the person who brought a healthy food initiative to schools as one of her biggest projects as first lady. Yes. Isn't that interesting? That's true. And the religious right lost their goddamn minds about it. How dare this woman tell me that I... She was bringing her food from afar and giving a portion to her maidens. <laughs> she was literally being a Proverbs 31 yeah. woman. How dare you tell me... That was, when, <laughs> that was when they were like... They passed a law to say that pizza is a vegetable because it has tomatoes on it. Right. Do you remember that? Michelle Obama wanted like less soda in schools and to limit how many times kid get, kids can have fried food a week. Yeah. And they're just like, no, absolutely not. My kids are eating hamburgers and hamburgers only. But yeah. she's literally, literally being a Proverbs 31 woman. Yeah. Um, as far as getting up early, Michelle Obama was known for getting up at 4 a.m. to work out, which is more Proverbs 31 points. Yeah. I don't even get she, up that early. <clears throat> I uh, have not gotten up at 4 a.m. since Chuck stopped having a middle of the night bottle. Hey. Well, and do not plan to do so again. Until and unless and until I have another baby who needs a 4 a.m. bottle. Hey, that's uh, an improvement. 
But by that time, you'll already know what you're doing. Yeah, but I should be on autopilot yeah. at that point, mm-hmm. hopefully. Uh, let's say, Just okay, like an so, IFB uh, wife. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Wait, where is that? Where is that triggered song again? <laughs> Come trigger yourself. Well, I don't know what I. We need to think of better words for it. You know, it's it's. Uh, can, we need Heather. It's Heather writes parodies. Heather Heath, please write us a parody. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, so she considers a field and buyeth it, and with the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. Obviously, this refers to the White House Gardens, which Michelle Obama did a lot of renovation on while she was first lady. I think she also planted a vegetable garden at the White House. That's true. Very famous for it. Super Proverbs 31 points on that one. Hell yeah. Okay, uh, she girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. I think strengtheneth her arms goes without saying. Here. Yeah, man. Michelle Obama's arms are jacked. And literally everyone knows that. It's a fact. Science. Uh, she perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. So number one from that little passage Clothed with Scarlet is clearly a prophecy about election night 2008 when the entire family wore coordinating red and black outfits. I remember but also, that. Yeah. yeah. Also, interesting fact, uh, Michelle Obama knit clothes for her family while in quarantine. So that matches oh. up with layeth her hands to the spindle and seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. That's sweet. Yeah. You know, as- and, and her family always like the whole family always does look very sharp and put together. So all her household are clothed with scarlet. Totally works. My mom knits me socks and hats literally all the time. And they're literally the best socks and hats. Anytime, Sadie, you've ever seen me wearing like a knitted hat, it's a hat that my mom made me. Yeah, you show those to me all the time. Yes. And you'll like post pictures of them sometimes. Yeah, I, I always make sure that I post pictures on Instagram of the hats that my mom knits so that she knows how much I, I wear them and how much I like them. So she'll keep making them for me. That That's adorable. It is sweet. She's very good at knitting. She's gotten really into it. She makes so many socks. She is is yeah i have many pairs of they're literally the best socks i wear them all the time except to the gym that's really because sp- well yeah they're they're wool you can't wear wool socks to the gym really i mean you can it's not a good it's idea. it's just a question of whether you should yeah it's they, i don't want to get i don't want them to get all gross and, and nasty so speaking of making things she maketh herself coverings of tapestry her clothing is silk and purple uh michelle obama has always dressed very nicely and appropriately for the occasion and That lady rocks a silk blouse. True. So I would say we're good on this one. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. This is pretty obvious. I would say that Obama is known in the gates and sits among the elders of the land. (laughs) Yep. Accurate. Okay. Uh, She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. This is one thing she may be missing. I'm not sure if Michelle Obama has ever made linen or made things to sell on consignment. It's possible. But maybe, maybe... It sounds like that was that. It, that sounds like something she would do for charity. I just I wasn't able to find it quickly, but maybe somebody will correct me on that one. Uh, strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. As first lady, Michelle Obama mentioned kindness in almost every speech she ever gave, hundreds of speeches, and she mentioned kindness in almost every single one. So I would say. That her tongue, in her tongue, is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. I have definitely heard her children and husband praising her. So, I think we're good. They better. <laughs> they, I mean, yeah, they better. Imagine being married to Michelle Obama and not talking about how amazing she is all the time and not in the creepy weird ifb where where they talk about how amazing their wives are like the, but like in a yeah I, there is oof. if i have a really bad day one of my favorite things to look up is videos of obama talking about how much he loves his wife that will get me that will make me happier every it's time it's extremely wholesome content Yes, and longtime listeners will know that my husband will also, if I'm having a bad day, my husband will do his impression of Obama. So, like, Sadie, you are a great American, <laughs> and you are an asset to our country. <laughs> and, and it's extremely adorable. I didn't know this, but that's hilarious. I, I know you've told me that before, but yeah. 
he's very good at impressions and so if i'm if i'm sad he will do impressions for me and that's one of his like gold star impressions yeah okay um he's good at that man he's 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 extremely good at it and that's that's one of that one and bubbles from trailer park boys are two of his really really good ones uh let's see finishing up the chapter many daughters have done virtuously but thou excellest them all favor is deceitful and beauty is vain but a woman that feareth the lord she shall be praised so in conclusion michelle obama is a proverbs 31 woman give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates mic drop we got to check on the tapestry thing that's under review if she if she like <laughs> you know if, if she we find out that she hasn't like done any tapestries uh or anything then we'll have to re- rescind it and then when she does the tapestry we'll we'll give it back to her although i want to say i th- some of the qual a lot of the qualities exemplified in this passage are universally good for everybody n- but like also this is a i i want to say this is a very specific ideal of femininity that not everybody can live up to and i think it's not right to hold one thing up as like this is what the ideal woman is so while michelle obama may exemplify the modern day proverbs 30 woman that doesn't make her the ideal that all women should be held to because frankly that's kind of an impossible standard (laughs) It is, but that's where that's why I look at this chapter the way that I do. It's a poem about an ideal. It's not supposed to be a list of rules. What do you think are the chances that this like was written about a specific woman? So there's nothing in the context that indicates that. The the context of the chapter is it's Solomon the chapter opens with Solomon's mother giving him advice on how to be a king. Because his, his his the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. So it's it's his mother giving him advice, and it doesn't say this is about one specific person. It's more it's a list of different ways to be a virtuous woman, different ways to express virtue in femininity. Like look at the way I look at it is look at this range of cool and awesome things that women can do, mm-hmm. and I think. The, the, it is a list. If you look at this as a list of standards, it's a pretty impossible standard to live up to. But if you look at it as a list of cool things that women can do, maybe, you know, maybe you're not somebody who has every capability or every skill that's mentioned in this chapter, but you might be great at one or two of these things. Maybe you're great at one of these things and you read this chapter and think, oh, there's something else I could add. I could add on this other thing and it would make me a more well-rounded person. So that's that's more how I look at the chapter. But like, if I were going to say to you, hey, Sadie, what is the ideal man? Wouldn't you say the ideal man is a funny metalhead who can do accurate impressions of every Simpsons character? No, that's my ideal man. But that's not what I think every man should be like. I think like the the i the ideal man is totally different from my ideal. The context of the chapter is Solomon's mother telling him a virtuous woman has these qualities, or look for a wife that has these qualities. I think that's extremely. Ju- I can just very Jewish. Okay, I can just imagine. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Solomon is bringing wife number five hundred and forty-seven home, uh, and Bathsheba's like her arms are far too skinny absolutely not shlomo you can (laughs) does she look like she is she has this woman has never girded a loin in her life (laughs) what are what what are you doing here (laughs) oh man but it's like it's a it's like when i tell you when I tell you possibly unsolicited advice about what kind of girls you should be dating and you kindly act like you wanted that advice all along. Mm. But I like, what do I always tell you? I'm like, you want a wife who enjoys quality time together, but she also has her own hobbies. You want somebody who is independent. You want somebody who's emotionally mature. That's me describing the ideal woman. But then when I say, when I add on, well, you like fashion, so you probably want to look for somebody who also appreciates fashion. You like to go to the gym, so you would probably want to look for a girlfriend or eventually a wife who will either go with you to the gym and wave, wave at you across the room or who has her own hobby that she'll do while, she, while you're at the gym. 
you really like getting up early to watch Formula One races that are around the world. So if you find a wife, you would probably be good for you to look for a wife who either is into Formula One and will watch it with you or has her own Saturday, Sunday morning hobby. That's me describing your ideal woman. Mm. So this chapter is about the ideal, not Solomon's ideal woman. You know what? I think I've just been so immersed in IFB stuff that I'm thinking I'm thinking like, you know how Jack Scott had all the women in the IFB dress in the style that his wife looked best in? That's yeah. The, uh, yeah. <laughs> See, I, and I don't think that's what this chapter is for. And I no. hate this chapter being used to shame women for what somebody thinks they should be when really it's a source of inspiration for me and I do enjoy it. And it's, it's like, um, it's a, it can be a positive thing and I hate seeing it used as a negative thing. So I hope our listeners enjoyed this Mother's Day special episode. I want to, I want to wish a big happy Mother's Day to all of you who are moms I just want to say that you are ideal and you don't have to live up to every point of a list to be totally awesome. You are the best mom for your child. And I know that you are doing your best. I hope you feel loved and supported on Mother's Day and every day. We love you, moms. We think you're great. And I also hope that if uh, your child brings home a partner who is substandard, you will be as critical as Bathsheba was in. Proverbs 31. <laughs> Do your best. Take care of yourself. Don't forget to learn and grow and set goals for yourself and be proud of yourself because you're doing a great job. Uh, all right. If uh, Thank you for listening to this episode. Uh, you can follow the podcast on Facebook and Instagram at Leaving Eden Podcast on Twitter at Leaving Eden Pod. Send us your pride month stories if you were raised in the ifb or a similarly repressive environment and you are an lgbtq person and you would like to tell us a story a happy story a sad story a funny story relating to such please send it to us at leaving even pod at gmail.com and who knows, you might get your story read on the air by one of us. And it'll be fun. Woo! Sadie, do you want to plug your social media? Absolutely. You can follow me on Instagram at Sadie Carpenter Music. You can follow me on Twitter at Hell yes Sadie or on TikTok at Sadie Carpenter One. And you can follow me on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter at G-A-V-R-I-E-L-H-A-C-O-H-E-N. Thank you so much for listening to this episode and bye-bye. Bye.